Welcome back to the Canadian Concussion Centre's webinar series, which is sponsored by LIUNA, the Labour's International Union of North America. Uh, if you've been here before, uh, you'll know my name is Leslie Rattan, and I'm really pleased to be moderating uh, our concussion uh, webinar series, which was developed for individuals with concussion, uh, their caregivers, as well as healthcare providers. And sessions uh, focus generally on some aspect of concussion. We start off with expert speakers for the first half hour, and then we have a question and answer period for the last half. So if you haven't been with us before, if you just scroll to the bottom of your screen, you'll see that there is a Q&A. Uh, so if you do have any questions for the speakers tonight, we just ask that you enter the questions there. If you're having any difficulties, technical difficulties, go to the chat and just enter your, your issue there and Christian can, uh, can help you out. Also, if um, just so that you know, on our con the Canadian Concussion Center website, we have all of our previous webinars recorded and archived. So you're able to go back and watch them uh, if there's any particular ones that are of, um, of interest. And right at this moment, I'm just going to have Christian, um, he has very kindly just put a link to the site and we're just running a short poll. Uh, it's helpful for us just to get a sense of who is in the, the audience. I'll give you a second there. Um, so for this evening's session, I'm really um, pleased to um, introduce both Patrick Brown and Dr. Charles Tatter, who you're going to be hearing from both of them. Uh, and they're going to be talking about legal um, legislation and guideline issues uh, in relation to concussion. So I'll just provide you with a bit of background on both. Dr. Charles Tatter is the director of the Canadian Concussion Centre. He trained in neurosurgery and neuropathology and was chair of neurosurgery at the University of Toronto. He was chief of neurosurgery at the Toronto Western Hospital and was a founder of Think First Canada, a national brain and spinal cord injury prevention foundation, and Parachute Canada, a national injury prevention agency. He held two research chairs at the University of Toronto and is an officer of the Order of Canada and an inductee of the Canadian Medical Hall of Fame and the Canadian Sports Hall of Fame. Currently, he is a scientist in the Kremble Brain Institute and director of the Canadian Concussion Centre at the Toronto Western Hospital. His book on catastrophic injuries in sports and recreation was published by the University of Toronto Press, and his practice primer on concussions appeared in the Canadian Medical Association Journal. He is also the author of 437 publications in peer-reviewed journals, and he is a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Neurotrauma and the Neuroscientist and is an associate editor of the Journal of Concussion. And next up is Patrick uh, Brown. Patrick is a partner at McLeish Orlando. He is one of a select set of lawyers who have been certified as specialist in civil litigation with the Law Society of Ontario, voted into Best Lawyers Canada, and listed by Lexpert as most frequently recommended by other lawyers. Patrick was elected and acted as president of the Ontario Trial Law Lawyers Association and was previously nominated as one of Canada's most influential lawyers in Canadian Lawyer Magazine. He initiated the most comprehensive coroner's review of pedestrian and cycling deaths in Ontario. This led to widespread changes in laws and infrastructure to make our roads safer. For his work, he was awarded the Active Transportation Champion of the Year by Toronto Central for Active Transportation. He is also the recipient of the prestigious 2018 Professional Award from the Ontario Brain Injury Association for his outstanding support of individuals living with the effects of brain injury. Patrick proudly sits on the steering committee of friends and families for safe streets, which he helped create. He is the former director of Cycle Toronto, Toronto Cyclists Union, founder of Bike Law Canada and head organizer of the Vulnerable Road User Coalition of Ontario, which fights for new laws to protect victims of road violence. He is committed to the highest form of advocacy for his clients and working towards safer communities. So really looking forward to hearing from both, uh, but we're going to start with Dr. Tatter. Well, thank you, Leslie, and uh, 
we just love the way you moderate this series. And tonight, I think I'm among friends with both Leslie and Patrick Brown as my uh, co-speakers. Uh, the title that I've chosen is Lawyers and Laws Are Important for the Treatment and Prevention of Concussion. And I'm not a lawyer, although I did disappoint my father when I decided to become a doctor and not a lawyer because he knew that uh, lawyers know their way around, unquote, quote, unquote. And Patrick certainly knows his way around and has become such a reliable advocate for safety on our streets. Um, I'm trying to advance the slide. Here we go. Uh, Leslie's already told you who I am, but um, I'd just like to spend a moment telling you about the people in our um, concussion center. I'm trying to, um, oops, get that. Is that banner covering the top of the screen or is it okay? I guess Looks it good. is covered. Yeah. Okay. So the feature features of concussion, um, in fact, let me just go back to the previous slide. Uh, it doesn't want to go back, but it was just a, it was just pictures of the members of our team to drive home the point that concussion is a team activity and that people who have been concussed uh, often require more than one type of uh, professional, more than one type of doctor, more than one type of therapist to get them through it. And in general, the features of concussion are these, that in about 75% of people, there's a complete recovery in a month, but it's the 25% that don't recover promptly that are the subject of tonight's discussion. And certainly people who listen to this uh, seminar uh, um, each uh, two weeks are those who didn't get better promptly. And you know that it's a diffuse injury and that it has more subtle deficits like dizziness, nausea, photophobia. In fact, there are about 65 uh, symptoms. And you see, I've outlined the fact that there are cumulative effects. So what we try to teach is that please don't get another concussion uh, while you're recovering from the previous concussion. And I do want to remind you that there are no reliable blood or imaging tests yet. And certainly our center has been very active in trying to discover ways to diagnose this condition uh, other than by clinical uh, signs and symptoms. But so far, it's still the only reliable way uh, what you tell the healthcare professional is the way it is. Um, oh my goodness. Next slide, please. I guess, Pat, um, Christian, you're going to have to advance them for me. Uh, so I, I won't be able to control your computer from here, but if you just take your mouse uh, or yeah. you can just hover down to the bottom left corner of your screen. Yeah. Uh, there is no, there's nothing in the bottom left corner. Oh, there we are. So oh, yes, I see it. There, so there's a, a forward and a back. Oh, okay. Okay, great, great. So let's go forward. Ah, okay. So in the acute phase, we have, um, you know, the, the usual symptoms should be gone in 30 days, but if they're not, then you can be subject to all of these other problems, like what happened to Rowan Stringer, and then the post-concussion syndrome, which most of the folks on this call are suffering from, and then the mental health issues are pretty common, like depression, anxiety, panic attacks, PTSD. In fact, according to our own data, about 35% of people with persisting symptoms have this. And then ultimately the problem of uh, more serious complications later on is a factor. 
but fortunately it only happened to about 1% of people. Concussions in themselves are extremely common. Imagine 1% of Canadians get them each year. And we um, try to uh, teach people how to recognize a concussion. And our goal is that pretty well everybody, like teachers, policemen, firemen, uh, sports coaches, uh, mothers and fathers should be able to recognize when a concussion has occurred. But the diagnosis still requires a healthcare professional like a doctor or a nurse practitioner. In fact, in Ontario, those are the only two healthcare professionals who can make the diagnosis. We, in our group, we originally focused on sports and recreation, but now there's a greater understanding of the of how common concussions are. And so now we do treat lots of people with motor vehicle crashes, partner violence, or other forms of assault. Um, School-based concussions falls among the elderly, and then of course, uh, sports and uh, recreation. Uh, the legal issues are significant, and Patrick is going to uh, tell us about this. And we don't have the perfect solution. There are still lots of issues during the legal journey that many people have to take after a concussion. Um, some of the issues that I, I had listed um, are shown uh, here. Uh, why do I need another doctor's exam, especially another IME? And perhaps Patrick is going to dwell on that. Why is my lawyer sending me to a different therapist? And in fact, this happens very frequently. And we do actually want the lawyers to assist us in steering people to the right uh, therapist. Uh, what does my lawyer mean by catastrophic? So there are a number of questions that hopefully Patrick will answer. And then finally, a question that we're asked repeatedly nowadays is, um, do I really need a spec scan or a computerized EEG? And we'll listen for Patrick to tell us the answers to that. In general, motor vehicle crashes are a major reason for needing a lawyer. Falls at home sometimes. I have a patient right now who fell on a sidewalk who has a lawyer um, helping her. Work-related injuries. Lawyers are sometimes needed. Sports and recreation. Well, there have been class action lawsuits. We all know about the NFL having to pay out um, a billion or so dollars to athletes who were irreparably damaged, military action occasionally, and school-based lawyers. Now that we have concussion laws, uh, lawyers may need to know about what's going on in schools. And then, of course, partner violence, domestic violence, and other criminal, criminal activities, all of those really require a lawyer to navigate the system. Um, it is good that in Ontario, we have gone this route. Um, as you know, Rowan Stringer was the one who prompted our politicians to act. And we now do have concussion laws in Ontario since 2018, as I've shown here. And they are continually updated through the regulations associated with the laws because after all, the jury made 49 recommendations about how to keep young people safe and how to keep our athletes safe. And so it's taking a long time to work our way through those 49 uh, recommendations. But now everybody up to the age of 25, everybody in a league uh, in sports, everybody at university is now covered by Rowan's Law. So good for Ontario for making that happen. Uh, this is just a picture of Rowan Stringer, what happened to her and the, um, you know, the results of a second hit.
to the head. This is called second impact syndrome, where the brain swells quickly and the patient succumbs to uh, swelling of the brain, generally happens to young people, but it can be totally prevented, as I've indicated on this slide, by preventing the second hit. So if the teacher or if the coach or if the referee are aware of this, this can be prevented, completely preventable. And kids must learn how to tell. So Rowan's Law, uh, many of you will have seen the symbol of Rowan's Law. It's become quite uh, prominent in Ontario schools. It's an excellent uh, move. Um, it hasn't spread to other provinces. So if every, anybody's on this uh, webinar tonight and is from another province, please consider advocating for a Rowan's type law in your province. So Ontarians, I think, are much better off because of Rowan's Law, and we'd like to see this spread across the country. And it's quite amazing. This is one of the new regulations where the athlete and the parent or guardian has to sign. If you can see my cursor, the athlete has to actually sign this code of conduct. So I think it's a huge step forward in making it known that things can happen to uh, athletes that need not happen if they if they learn about the code of conduct um, and this is just an example of Ontario working its way through all 49 uh, recommendations and this particular uh, poster is now in every school so I think that Patrick Brown and other lawyers may be called upon to help enforce these laws from time to time in the school-based setting. The diagnosis um, is so important that patients go to a doctor or a nurse practitioner, and we must teach people to tell, especially kids. In other words, if you're suffering a headache or dizziness, don't keep it to yourself. Tell somebody that you've had this problem, and hopefully someone will be schooled in the recognition of what may be a concussion. And certainly with children, we have to teach them how to tell. Uh, we still, as I said, cannot diagnose a concussion with a blood test or with an image. We're still looking for this to happen. And around the world, researchers are really hot on the trail of finding a, a test that is going to indicate a concussion, but so far it hasn't happened. And it certainly hasn't happened with SPECT or computerized EEG, but maybe Patrick and I will end up brawling over that one. So you still cannot do it with imaging. And this is a perfectly normal MR. It's, you know, it's a beautiful test. It does show more severe injuries than, than a concussion but it still cannot identify a concussion, sadly, but maybe someday it will. And the same is true for any other biomarker. Uh, a lot of money has been spent by pharmaceutical industry to try to come up with a biomarker, even a test of saliva, for example, might someday be an effective biomarker, but it hasn't happened yet. Um, so if we go to the next slide, some websites are excellent. I want to point out Parachute uh, Canada is an excellent site for finding information about concussion. And this is the guideline that they put out for concussion in sport, but it really is applicable to any type of concussion, whether it's a motor vehicle accident or what. And this, I think, is really helpful that OBIA, the Ontario Brain Injury Association, has a hotline. And in fact, it does recognize the fact that a lot of people do need a lawyer. And here's, here's what's on their website, tips for selecting a qualified trauma lawyer. So it's not just me that's advocating 
that people often need a lawyer, but it's Obaya as well and many other brain injury organizations feel the same. I mentioned useful websites for concussion, like Parachute is Excellent, CDC in the United States, Obaya in Canada, uh, the Ontario website, this is the Ontario government website, is excellent, ontario.ca slash concussions to learn about concussions. So there are lots, lots of information out there that is reliable. So over to you, Patrick. I'm going to stop sharing. Oh, and uh, Patrick will need to unmute your microphone. Okay, well, I, I think everybody can hear me okay. Uh, firstly, uh, Charles, uh, thank you, and, and, and Dr. Rattan, thank you for the introduction, and thank you for all you do for people who suffer from concussion, and as well, um, I know Charles from, from dealing with you over time that you've done so much, uh, not only obviously in advocating for individuals with concussion, but also making sure that other people don't suffer it and bringing about laws like Rowan's Law and other initiatives that you know really move the needle and making sure that these things don't happen um, as, frequent, as frequently, unfortunately, as they do. And many of these are preventable. Today, I wanted to talk to you a bit about, obviously, legal issues around concussion. Now, my background is a lawyer. I am not a doctor. Um, I can tell you a bit about perhaps why a, a lawyer is going to talk about concussion. And, and I think some of it perhaps is obvious. But you look at Humpty Dumpty, who sits on a wall, and clearly he's sitting next to a lawyer here and one has to ask himself you know why on earth would that happen you know, because Humpty Dumpty was sat on a wall he had a great fall and unfortunately all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty back together again so I mean the first place for anybody who suffers a concussion is not to go to a lawyer and that is clear you're you're not if you go to a lawyer right after you sustain what you believe to be a concussion, firstly, the perception of you, which isn't a good perception, is you're a litigious person. And in my area, which is an area of law, of insurance companies, of settlements, of defense lawyers, litigious people aren't looked upon favorably. So the first stop, whenever you have a concussion, seems to be obvious, but it's getting to a medical specialist. And I, I say that, and, and I highly recommend uh, that you see your medical practitioners to get that diagnosis, to get the advice, and get the plan for treatment that you need. And there's a lot of information out there and a lot of individuals because of the industry that can make money off of concussions that call themselves so-called experts or specialists in that area. And if I can tell you anything from a legal standpoint, get to the people who actually do specialize in that. And, and sometimes the best place to start is your family physician and go and report your symptomology to the family physician and they can guide you or perhaps a concussion clinic that's recognized uh, with specialists in the area, like Dr. Tatter, like Dr. Tatter, like their concussion clinic, so that you know you're in good hands. And really the hope, is, as Dr. Tatter said, is 75% are recovered within a month. And that's great. And that's what you want. Unfortunately, there's that percentage that don't. And because of that, you need people such as myself and other lawyers to perhaps help you navigate through the system. And if you suffer a concussion and you have symptoms, 
you're in the road route to recovery, but things aren't going the way perhaps it's expected for other individuals. And all of a sudden you start th seeing things fall apart as, as we know, with it, whether it's school, whether it's work, whether it's your family unit, whether it's your friends, going out socially, doing the things that you like to do. And all of a sudden, those things start to dwindle and they're starting to be impacted. And you're not better. You ask your doctor or your specialist or nurse practitioner, my concussion symptoms are persisting. I have persistent post-concussion symptoms. How long do you think they will last? And they will advise you as best they can. They will tell you what happens with other individuals that do suffer and people that they see on a regular basis who do sustain these types of injuries. You'll also address, do you have other injuries? As, as Dr. Tatters already indicated, there are other things that are in play that as the concussion symptoms continue, you can see other psychological psychiatric injuries uh, such as depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder. And these compound on your ability to move forward. So do you need more help during recovery? Do all the king's horses and are all the king's men, did they put you back together? I'd love to say we've got a great OHIP system. I'd love to say that we've got tons of governmental support networks for financial security for the individual, but they're not there. And unfortunately, not everybody gets better. And unfortunately, you gotta see lawyers. You've got money issues because now you're not working perhaps. You need money coming into the household. You're not getting accommodations at work. They're not providing you things that would make it more easy for you to continue with your, your job, uh, whether it's all kinds of different uh, accommodations that are available. Child care has now become problematic. You might have an elderly parent. Uh, you you may need counseling for your for your 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 spouse or your partner to continue with your relationship. And all these things are compounding. And unfortunately, after that one month, you find you're outside of that seventy five percent that Dr. Tatter said exists. So. This is a big slide of a, a lot of different stuff, but you can look at the top part of that slide. And I believe it's not easy, and it's not easy at all to get help despite an ongoing concussion and still having the symptoms and not getting better. We have great brain injury associations that provide, but they're very limited in funding. We have an OHIP system that I believe is stretched and doesn't provide available treatment that's necessary for certain people to recover and move forward. Most people at work have some short-term disability, but that can fall apart fairly quickly. It's very limited. Some fortunately have long-term disability programs through work, which gives them some income while they're suffering a disability. But unfortunately, sometimes those are, are not always recognized by the long-term disability insurance company. CPP means you have to have a severe and prolonged injury, which makes it very difficult to access because it, you need medical opinions that say this is gonna go on for a very long time. Workers' comp is a system that some people fall into, but it's not a great system. It doesn't provide the necessary treatment or available benefits to an individual that they need. Our social security nets, ODSP, Ontario Works are limited. Many people don't wanna go on that for various obvious re reasons. And then you've got auto insurance for the car crashes. Because those don't all take care of you and you can't manage that system yourself, then you need a lawyer. And a lawyer is going to look at not only whether or not they're gonna assist you in getting any of those benefits that I just named, which can be complicated in some aspects, for instance, the statutory accident benefit schedule is complicated. It's almost more complicated uh, than our tax act. If you, uh, in relation to long-term disability cares, are trying to get long-term disability, you know that they're going to put you through some hurdles. 
So what can the lawyer do? They can bring a lawsuit. That's where somebody sues. It can arise, as, as, as Charles has already indicated, from people who fall. We call that occupier's liability, meaning you got to keep your premises reasonably safe for people coming on. And if you don't, and somebody falls and they hit their head and suffers a concussion, then potentially that particular entity may be responsible. It could be, you know, the city. It could be the owner of a building. You've got sports injuries, as Charles has already indicated, that occur far too frequently, but hopefully are diminishing because of things like Rowan's Law, but they will still exist. And that's because certain protocols like Rowan's Law aren't being followed and that people do suffer these injuries because things weren't followed. And that potentially could lead to lawsuits. Car crashes are obvious. Uh, they're far too prevalent. Uh, bike crashes with vehicles striking cars, uh, drivers hitting cyclists. That happens far too frequently, I can tell you. In that area, even though the people inside vehicles, um, the rates of injury and fatalities are going down when it comes down to people on bikes or pedestrians, in fact, being hit by drivers, uh, those rates are going up and they will continue to go up. And because of that, you may have a lawsuit in order to get compensation from those types of incidents. I already mentioned school a bit um, through the sports injury. And then of course you have boating crashes and you have all kinds of different things that may give rise to a lawsuit. Do you have a good lawsuit? It depends. You're gonna have to consult a lawyer to find out what the merits are behind that and what that lawyer, she or he can do for you. So one of the first steps, if you ask me, I've, I've suffered a concussion. I'm not getting better uh, to the extent that I was hoping. And I'm starting to find that things are falling apart for me and I do need help. And then you should consult a lawyer. Now, which lawyers are you going to consult? Well, we're finding it used to be people would go to their mm, uh, real estate lawyer. Who's a good lawyer that I should consult in relation to this concussion and this injury and my rights? in order to access benefits or pursue a lawsuit. And it used to be maybe that real estate lawyer or that wills and estates lawyer say, mm, go to these people, they're quite good. We're not seeing that as frequently anymore. Then we're finding mm, the internet. Well, the internet's full of everybody's the best lawyer. Every lawyer is great. Every lawyer is going to market themselves on the internet in a way uh, that they're going to sound like, wow, they're really good. It's very, very difficult to navigate that system. And not all lawyers are the same. So you can ask some specific types of questions in relation to finding a lawyer. Do they specialize in this area? Well, this area is called civil litigation. It's not criminal law. It's not real estate. It's not wills and estates. It's civil litigation. Do they specialize in that? In order to be deemed a specialist, they have to get a designation from the Law Society of Ontario who actually gives the designation out. In order for them to meet that designation, they have to follow a specific set of protocols. They have to have so many trials and they have to have so many references that that panel would say, okay, we're gonna give that particular individual a stamp. Does that mean that they're somebody you should go? No but it's one added thing that you can pay attention to. You can take a look at peer review sites. These are ones where the lawyers are asked, who would you recommend a lawyer to? Who would you send your family member to? And those lawyers will vote on that. And all those peer review sites then post those lawyers who enter into, let's say it's Lexburg, best lawyers, or other ones where they're peer review sites by what other lawyers would say they would recommend. You have to ask and do some research on the selection of lawyers. Sometimes where people are given names, sometimes it's best to interview a number of lawyers. Ending up at the first lawyer doesn't mean always that um, you should select them. Maybe you should interview three lawyers and ask them some very specific questions. Do you do concussion cases? How many cases do you take on a year? Do you only do cases for the people who have suffered the injury 
or do you do work for the insurance company? Do you do criminal law as well? Are you a general practitioner? And all these types of questions that are out there online that you can ask will allow you to understand how or whether or not that lawyer is right for you and whether or not they truly can handle your case. How big is their staff? Do they have technology? Do they have an office? All these things are really important because sometimes if you're not better and you don't get better and things perhaps at times can snowball and get worse, this can be one of the most significant decisions that you make. And not all lawyers are the same. Some lawyers invest a lot of money in making sure that you have the medical experts you need. Neuropsychologists who are going to do medical legal reports for you. Neurologists, neurosurgeons, uh, neuropsychiatrists. These are different individuals that may eventually have to do medical legal opinions in order to advance your case. Are those lawyers prepared to finance that in order that you have the necessary tools to be successful in your litigation? As Charles indicated, uh, Dr. Tatter indicated, and I'll get into this a bit about concussion cases, but they're not easy. They're actually difficult cases. When you're dealing with the lawyer, make sure that because you want some time with them, that they'll give you that free consultation. But then you say, well, wait a second. All of a sudden, I got this concussion. I've got these ongoing symptoms. Things are falling apart. And I don't even have income coming in, and nor can I afford you. I'm not paying that hourly rate to a lawyer. I'm not getting, I cannot afford to get that invoice once a month to pay the legal fees because I don't have money coming in or the money I do have coming in, I really need to support my family and perhaps my treatment. Lawyers who do this work, they do it on a contingency fee arrangement. That's just another word for if you don't win, you don't pay, the lawyer will charge you at the end of the case and they will charge you a percentage of the amount awarded to you. That contingency fee agreement, if you want to take a look to see what it says, it's actually with the law society. They said, if you want to do a contingency fee agreement here in Ontario, you should follow this particular type of agreement. And they have it online and it's available and you can see what it says. But it contains all those things that I indicated to you because you want to make sure that you can continue with the case, not have to fund it yourself and that the lawyer funds it and charges you at the end if successful. If the lawyer doesn't want to charge you a contingency fee agreement, uh, it may be because they don't have confidence in the ability to win the case and make it meaningful. So they have a lot of value so that people can access justice. Now, there is a question of how quickly should you get to see a lawyer? And, and I told you about that thing at the beginning that you don't want to look like a litigious person and you've just had the concussion and the next thing you know it, the next morning you're in the lawyer's office. That's true. But you should see a lawyer to get some advice. You don't have to retain them. Many lawyers who deal with these cases at the beginning would say, you know what, it's best to follow up with your doctor, report your symptoms on a regular basis, and then we'll find out how you're doing if things aren't better in three months, we'll see how you're doing in six months. It's a bit called wait and see, but it is a way of dealing with it. But by seeing the lawyer early, you can understand what the limitation periods are about your case. And unfortunately, there's some really short notice periods, especially in relation to snow and ice on, on sidewalks. There's 10 days. Occupiers in those buildings where you I told you you could have a slip and fall at 60 days. There's a seven days notice for auto insurance benefits. So the lawyer can tell you what some of those things that have to be done early on. If I suffered a concussion, but I'm not sure if I'll need to sue or get a lawyer, should I still try to protect myself? Yes, you should. Dr. Tatter said, and, and, and I, 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 I agree with this, I, and, and I would never disagree either on any medical term and no should any lawyer uh, be your doctor because they're not. They don't treat you. They don't direct your care. Medical professionals do that. But what I would say 
is if there's no blood test, there's no imaging, then because these cases are based on subjective complaints from the individual with limited objective evidence, it makes them very tough. And why it makes it tough is because those complaints are coming from the individual. And when a complaint makes, when an individual makes certain complaints, subjective complaints, it opens for someone to say, hmm, I don't believe them. I don't think they're telling the truth. I think they just want money. And because of that, they treat them with suspicion. And that includes obviously insurance companies, people who defend these cases, and they are treated in part with suspicion. Because if they look at the statistics that we've seen and, and Dr. Tatter indicated, well, how come you're not part of that 75% that get better? Why are you in this very low percentage that continue to have these ongoing problems? So the key to these cases is credibility and that's your credibility as an individual. And you have to protect that throughout the entire process. And part of that means that on a, you have to see your medical professionals and you have to report all your symptoms on a regular basis. And why do I say that? Because you don't want someone later on saying, well, they never told their family doctor that they had ongoing dizziness. You never told your doctor about your headaches. You never said anything about your memory. You never said anything about that. And because of that, we don't think it's connected to what your fall was. It must be something else because you never told them about that. So protect your credibility by reporting your symptoms on a regular basis as much as practically possible and in accordance with what your doctors think. How do I protect myself from these suspicions? And, and again, maintaining the credit, well, report symptoms regularly as I see the wait and see but it also takes some photographs. If, if, if you've had a fall or you've got bumps on your head or, or imaging that might help or imaging of the scene or how the thing happened, take a photograph. I can tell you this too. Don't mess your case up by not following up with treatment. Treatment not only is good for you medically to recover and move forward so that you get better, but the lack of not following up with treatment will have a profoundly negative impact on your ability to have a successful lawsuit because what they say is you don't mitigate your damage. That means you didn't follow the treatment. Your physicians and rehab team said you should. And because of that, it's your responsibility. You're the victim of your own misfortune. And unfortunately, that is a standard of the law. You didn't mitigate you didn't take the treatment that was available. Be proactive in the medical system. It's broken, but the squeaky wheel does get the grease. So make sure that you are in there and saying, is there any other specialist that you think, doctor, I should see? Is there a neurologist or neuroradiologist or neuropsychologist? Is there other individuals that you think may help me in my recovery? If you pick up one thing from this, me as a lawyer telling you how to promote and have enhance your case, follow this one if this is the only thing you remember. Honesty, honesty, honesty. That means being upfront about your symptomology. That means being upfront about any pre-existing conditions. That's being upfront about how you feel when you have good days and bad days. Try to be as honest and truthful as possible. And most people are, but sometimes somebody starts piping your, uh, it's better to tell them this because if you don't, you're going to lose your benefits. And then all these people are chattering on you on how you can enhance your case. And in fact, if any of that pushes you to somewhere where you're not honest, that will hurt your case. So for whatever I can say is ignore bad advice. And there's a lot of bad advice out there. Remember, it's always better to have your health than a good lawsuit. The system that you go into for the compensation, whether it's the benefit system or it's a lawsuit, will never provide you the full compensation. I can guarantee that. Because none of those systems are designed to do that. Always remember when you're speaking to your lawyer, they're going to talk about risk. 
because they can never guarantee you a result. They're going to do a risk-based assessment and give you the parameters of where your case can go. Charles asked one of the questions is, how long will this take? Well, that's one of the toughest questions your lawyer is going to face. We've got a system, a legal system, that is backlogged. It's full of delay. It moves as the quickest, slowest moving part, and there's a ton of slow moving parts. Lawyer scheduling, the process can be long and taxing, and that's an expectation you should understand. Many people are concerned about lawsuits because it opens them up to people looking at their clinical notes and records, their background. Yeah, well, it is an open book. Unfortunately, the legal system opens a book into your life that perhaps is not open in other circumstances. And it's one that you should understand will happen. Charles also asked, how come so many examinations? Why do I have to see that other specialist in order to get a diagnosis and prognosis when, when I already have one? Well, firstly, your lawyer, if they have a lawsuit, in many instances, has to have a medical legal expert. You can have the best treating experts treating you, dealing with you, but not all of them want to go to court. Not all of them want to write a medical legal report. And because of that, your lawyer may feel that they should want to send you to a specialist in order to provide a medical legal opinion because they have to be crafted in a specific way in order to be allowed into court. So that's why the lawyer may send you to a specialist, a medical legal expert, in these cases, a neurologist, a neuropsychologist, perhaps a neurosurgeon, perhaps a psychologist, but they want to get a medical legal report. Now, if this was an adversarial system, that would be fine, but it is. Most lawsuits have two sides, and the other side has the ability to request that you be examined by one of their specialists. It's called a defense medical exam or an insurance exam. And you have to go to those examinations and they have to examine you and they too provide opinions. Now, I have my own thought about that process, but I can tell you one thing, that your best approach on dealing with a defense medical examiner is just be honest, be truthful, be upfront and do your best. Don't try to outthink them, outsmart them. Don't think that they... Um, you know, that you you can you can do things that are going to enhance your case better. Just be honest and truthful through the process because they do do things called validity testing. These are tests that they're going to have you potentially do in order to determine whether or not you're telling the truth. And remember what I told you at the beginning, these cases are really based a lot on credibility and whether or not the subjective complaints that you've reported to your doctors are going to be believed. Accusations of malingering, that can happen. That says, mm, we don't think that uh, you have a concussion. We don't think that's a proper diagnosis. We don't think that these symptoms that you're experiencing are perhaps connected to depression from your concussion or anxiety or other things. We think you have what's called a psychological diagnosis of malingering. It's just another way of saying that you're not telling the truth and you're lying for money. They might wrap it up into some code words that are under a DSM-4 psychological, you know, diagnosis. But what they're saying with malingering is that you're not telling the truth in order to obtain money or some other gain. Those have to be treated very seriously. The one thing of uh, ensuring that you don't let them open the door to such things is again, be honest, upfront, don't gild the lily, don't exaggerate your symptoms, but also don't underestimate what's going on with you. Surveillance, do they conduct surveillance? Of course they do. They're gonna watch you with video. They're gonna try to photograph. They're trying to find things that you've told your doctors or you've said under oath that you cannot do. And then they wanna get their private investigator to get out and see you doing it. And then when they find that, they suggest, well, they're not really telling the truth about shoveling the driveway, are they? Because they told Dr. Tatter that they can't do the driveway because of balance issues. You know what? We've got a video here of you shoveling your driveway. Now this case has nothing to do with shoveling your driveway. 
but it has everything to do with credibility. And if you think that they wouldn't tell the truth about shoveling the driveway, do you think that they're going to tell the truth when there are a lot of monies at stake? And that's what they do. It's called injecting credibility into your case. And the best way to prevent it is by being honest. Your lawyer is going to be able to take these challenges with these attacks. And you know how they're going to do it? Is they're going to find the people that know you the best. To say, you know what? You really did do well before this concussion. In fact, you were working. In fact, you were one of our best workers. I knew Bill. Bill was one of the lights of the party. He was always fun. He was always out. He was social. And, you know, I saw Bill after this, and he really is having a hard time. He's having so many difficulties. I see him taking breaks at work. Those are called before and after witnesses. And those are really important to help you so that they understand that this is a legitimate, real disability that is persisting and having a huge impact on your life. I've already told you about being honest road tests, but avoid things called absolutes. Absolutes are kind of when you use the word all the time, every time. I never stay away from those words. Always remember you have good da days and bad days when reporting your symptoms. Admit things when they get better. I mean, that goes to your credibility too. Seek the accommodations that are being made available to you. It's better to give something a try, as long as your doctors think it's okay, than to sit home with your lights out and hope that you're going to get a big settlement. Be nice, be likable. Those are things that the other side's looking at you because most of them filed jury notices and those are factors that are so important. Have a good lawyer. You're going to be subject to an examination for discovery. That's just where they get to ask you questions under oath. You'll be prepared by your lawyer before that. Be truthful. Make sure you review your clinical notes and records before or have the lawyer make sure to tell you what's in there. You can get accommodations for things like that. So make sure that if you have issues with screens, you need additional breaks, you want it virtual or in person, make sure the lighting's proper for you. Those are things that's called an examination discovery you have to go through. A mediation, something where all the parties come in, they try to settle your case. Uh, it's all confidential. Usually those are all done virtually. You should have support. It might be a support pet, a support person, somebody with you as you're going to be in your own environment and you're going to be making decisions on trying to resolve your case and make sure your expectations are set by your lawyer in advance. If the case doesn't settle, 95% of the cases do settle, but if it's not settled at a mediation, maybe it's going to go to a pretrial. Well, that's where a judge, she's going to give her opinion on what she thinks might happen with your case. You're not going to have to do much at the pretrial because you have limited participation. But again, they'll try to see if they can settle your case at that time. They might look at issues of trial management. That too is being done much more virtually. And from concussion clients of mine, uh, most things like the pretrial, like the mediation, like the examination are being done virtually. So make sure that you set up a situation that's best for you in the sense of your lighting, your screen. Make sure there's an understanding you might need to take breaks if the volume or the sound is a problem or you have issues in dealing with Zoom or the technology. Work that out in advance, okay? If you settle your case, you may find yourself with some other issues. I thought I'd touch on this. If you go out and get a litigation loan from a litigation loan company, you're going to find out that that thing expanded itself into a big, giant loan because they've got huge interest rates, but they're going to want to be paid back. You're going to have to deal with your lawyer and their account under that contingency agreement. There may be assignments from, let's say, if you get Ontario Works or Ontario Disability Support, they want their money back too, and that has to be dealt with. Sometimes you have the option of a structured settlement, which is just a form of a structured annuity that people who have suffered as victims of, 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 of others' negligence have the ability, when they get their award, to put it into what's called a structured settlement. 
taxes. There's no taxes on, 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 on personal injury awards. There's not. So many people always wonder about that, but it's not taxable. So that's kind of, I'm, I'm, I've got, uh, you know, only four minutes left. So I thought <laughs> that's uh, what I touch upon. Um, and I can answer any other questions that are needed. Great. Thank you so much. Um, we do have a few questions. And if both of you are okay to stay just a few minutes over time, Christian has indicated that's okay. So I'm going to jump right in. Perfect. We have a question um, from Carrie, and she indicates that her son was injured while in school in a faulty building by a falling concrete ceiling tile. His physician ordered that he not return to school for the rest of the semester. He's a music major and it was immediately identified that his hearing was impacted. The school did not reach out in support of unfulfilled courses or medical bills. A CT scan determined that his cochlear bone uh, was probably injured, impact, impacting his processing of sound, causing severe migraines, hyperacusis, balance and vision problems. My question is about how the law perceives long I think long-term treatment and therapy since his physicians still have him going to vestibular and vision therapy uh, as he's still not at his baseline even after two years. He's still got dizziness uh, and issues with certain sounds and stimuli. How would the law assess damages if he will have uh, long-term disabilities? It's a long one. Well, I, I'm, since it's a law on assessing damages, I do that on a regular basis. And so I can answer as best I can. Firstly, I'm going to make the assumption that the people who are running that building to allow a concrete block to fall on somebody are going to be found negligent and at fault. And um, it sounds pretty obvious on that factual circumstance that that will be the case. In that particular matter, because it's a building and we call it occupier's liability, you're not going to have all these benefits available that you would in an auto case. So there's no benefits that flow to you in that circumstance other than any kind of private insurance you might have had. So now you're left with your lawsuit. And your lawsuit is going to award you at some stage an amount of damages, which is another amount for money. The first area of damages that he'd be looking at is called pain and suffering. We call those general damages. It's for pain and suffering and loss of enjoyment of life. To give you some context of what that damage means is the most anybody can get in Canada is 450,000. And our Supreme Court of Canada said in the 1970s, that amount is restricted to the most horrific type of catastrophic cases, such as severe traumatic brain injury, where somebody almost needs 24-hour attendant care, or quadriplegia, where they require ongoing. They're going to be the 450, and everybody else down to the stub toe is going to be the range of damages awarded for that. So I can't really tell you um, in relation to his situation where his general damages would fall. But if it's two years and he has persistent symptoms and it's impacting schooling, work, or otherwise, and his physicians think that that will continue based on his prognosis, well, then that is a significant general damage claim, which will likely be in the six figures, but perhaps not in those upper ranges that I talked about. Next, Great. he has what's Sorry. called, that's the second area of damage, is loss of earning capacity. As a result of his long-term disability or consequences, and based on the prognosis by his medical practitioners, if it's found that he's not going to be able to earn the same amount he otherwise would if he was able-bodied and this never happened, then he's allowed to make a claim for that differential. So for instance, maybe certain promotions aren't going to be available. Maybe uh, the individual cannot work part-time or has to work part-time. Maybe the individual can't put overtime. Maybe certain avenues are not available to them. And the court has to come up with an understanding of what that loss of earning capacity claim is. I and mean, it's based pretty much on what I just told you. 
And it's usually done by what the medical professionals say, what's going to happen to that individual. And it also generally does require sometimes a forensic economist or accountant to project that loss. Then the last main area, and I'm not touching on all areas, but the main one is future care costs. And when you hear about multi-million dollar awards, they're generally because of the future care costs an individual needs. And all that is, is your lawyers would ask the medical professionals, what is it that he's going to need from a treatment standpoint moving forward? What is he gonna need from a services standpoint? And can you tell us what you think those things will be? And then it goes to a future care cost expert and they cost that out and that's projected into the future for as long as the medical professional thinks that person needs them. And those are future care costs. So I can't give you a precise answer about how much that case would be in those areas, but those are the parameters that are looked at in order to quantify damages. Didn't touch on all of them. There's other things where family members who have people who suffer injuries get loss of care guidance companionship for egregious conduct. And this is one where I think, hmm, it, why is a concrete thing falling on someone's head? That could result in punitive damages. And that's meaning to punish and not compensate. So that's kind of the general area of damages. I didn't touch on all of them, but I, I tried to give you a brief overview. Great, thank you very much. Michelle asks, I've had multiple concussions, but can't get the help and treatment and testing that I need to properly recover because I can't afford it. How can we petition the government to start covering these services? Leave that one to you, Charles. Um, <clears throat> that's, that's a great question. It's something that's on our minds all the time because we can't um, get even the testing done, we we need we need increased government funding, increased OHIP funding for things like neuropsychology. Neuropsychology used to be an insured um, a, um, benefit, but after Mike Harris, that was gone. He fired all the neuropsychologists in our hospital. And the same with physiotherapists and the same with occupational therapists. So most, most of the therapists that we depend on to manage persisting concussion symptoms are out of pocket, paid. And if it's a motor vehicle crash, very often we can convince the insurance company to pay. If it's a, an injury at work, very often we can make the case to the WSIB and they'll pay. But there's a large number of other people who don't have that opportunity and they're out of luck. It's really, they have to wait and wait and wait. It's a big problem. It has not been solved in the last 15 years or so as it's gradually increased as we now know more about concussions the need has gotten even greater because we now know that people just won't get the best treatment they won't recover to the best of their ability if they can't get help from the appropriate therapists and very often they will go to inappropriate therapists that and Dr. Tartaglia covered some of this a couple of weeks ago and spend their money on inappropriate treatment, unfortunately, because they haven't been properly researched and there's no validity to them. They're not scientifically proven. There's no evidence for them. You know, I'm there's you know a whole string of them that she mentioned. So it's a problem. There are a lot of unsolved problems with concussion. And when you think that, you know, the figures are 400,000 a year in our country of new ones, plus the ones who haven't gotten better from last year. So there is a big need. And I think pressure on our legislators, pressure on the insurance companies to have a better way of dealing with 
these this need. Hopefully, it'll come in my lifetime. We're advocating for it, but we, we can't do it alone. Great, thank you. Marika is asking, she's saying there's a lot of emphasis on schools, students, athletes, teachers, but what regulations in Ontario are being made to teach the family doctors about long-term concussion symptoms? Speaking from experience of seeing many, they seem unaware of the symptoms beyond the acute initial phase, particularly depression and anxiety get dismissed as only that. Often they say you will get better eventually and seem unaware of the resources out there. Want me to handle that one, Patrick? Well, I mean, yeah, I'll let you handle that. I'll throw my two cents in when the <laughs> client tells me, because they do tell me these types of things, what I say to them. But I'd be interested to hear what you had to say on that. Well, believe it or not, things have gotten better. Uh, when I went to medical school a few decades ago, the word concussion never appeared. When we did a survey about 15 years ago, we found that about 30% of medical schools were teaching concussion. When we did, when we repeated the survey about five or six years ago, we found that almost every medical school was now teaching something about concussion. So I think for the more recent graduates, you will get a fair amount of knowledge in most general practitioners and we have to have a system the public health system really demands the involvement of general practitioners that's your mainstay to try to stay healthy to try to recover from injury and i'm more and more impressed with what the current trainees, the current graduates of our medical schools, they are much more aware of concussion than they used to be. So it is improving. I don't think it's ideal yet. But if you find that one one of your family doctors just isn't cutting it, isn't you're not making progress with your concussion, then you should try to go to another. Although family doctors are in terribly short supply. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I I hear it. I do hear it from my clients, and um, and and also the last thing you want to do is look like you're doctor shopping. So it's like, oh, go we'll find another family doctor. Well, that doesn't look good. It looks like you're doctor shopping. I I I would certainly think that, um, and, and this perhaps is a common sense approach. I don't know uh, that assuming that the family doctor is not receptive, um, seems to be um, not receptive to the symptoms or to perhaps the condition itself, doctor, is there anyone else that you could refer me to that may assist me? And uh, canvas with them, are there other individuals that they think they could make a referral to? Because maybe they're not used to concussion cases and uh, they could make a referral through the OHIP system to another thing. Is there any concussion clinics that are legitimately recognized that you think might help me? and then get the referral from that doctor to someone else. Is there a neurologist that you think that I should see? So it's again, they might not be that receptive, but they might know who would be. Great. That's a great Thank suggestion. You. Yeah. Uh, we've got someone saying, my osteopath tells me that a spec scan can help determine changes in blood flow, which might be related to the concussion. Is this useful information? I'll let you choose who wants to. Patrick, first. you go first this time. Oh, well, you know, listen, I'm I'm not going to jump into the medical arena about spec scans and whether or not they're proper diagnostic tools for concussion. But I can tell you in the legal world, it's a hot issue. And that there are judges that are accepting testimony from neurologists who are referring to studies. Not so much in saying that the spec scan is the sole diagnostic tool, but they're accepting it as part of evidence as a secondary tool that assists in the diagnosing of concussion. And 
I, there's a whole bunch of cases on that, and I'm not going to get into it, but it's gone back and forth a bit, um, like a tennis match. And uh, it sounds like there's certain ones, the neurologists and, and others, that feel it has no place. There's some that try to sell it as a sole diagnostic tool. And then there's ones that say, no, it's not, but it can be used as a secondary tool to assist in coming towards a diagnostic. And personally, I think the courts and where they're moving with it is on that third area. Rightly or wrongly, that's how I think what I'm seeing from the evidence that's coming into the courtroom. Well, from my standpoint, spec scans are useless, <laughs> waste of time. <laughs> and in fact, there is some radiation involved with a spec scan because you're you're um, injecting a radioactive tracer, but it's usually a small dose and no one has ever been significantly harmed by, by a spec scan, but it is useless. You pretty well, you know, the spec these are you know complex terms sensitivity and specificity means how often will it pick up something it, the the ju the test just doesn't have the evidence to prove that it's useful in concussion it's it's a technology that has uh, that should be um you know superseded by things like MRI studies. If you said, will an MRI study someday be useful in concussion? I think that is becoming more likely. In our own center, we've been desperately looking for some clue that MRI is helping with uh, concussion. We're not there yet. It has not been sufficiently sensitive or specific, but I have a feeling, don't quote me, that maybe in the next few years, MRI will become a useful biomarker as perhaps some of the blood tests. You know, I, I love what's happened in cardiology. If you go to the emergency department thinking that you might be having a heart attack, the first thing they're gonna do is a blood test and it's very accurate. Hopefully we'll arrive at that same um the same validity with concussion, but we're not there yet, unfortunately. Okay. I'd certainly defer to that opinion. What I'd say is what lawyers are looking for and why they want to look at it is they want to remove that subjective element and come up with some type of objective tool and say, there it is, and point to the screen. And and, and they can point to something to, to try to show it. And sometimes they stretch it just too far and maybe it's not there. And maybe all those other things we talked about in relation to concussions and what needs to be proved um, have to be followed and that there's no, there's no easy identifier perhaps. Okay, thank you. Well, I think this is going to be our, our record for webinar <laughs> length, but there's still people watching, so I'm going to try I'm, and get in a I'm few more go get I'm going to go get <laughs> breakfast. Um, someone is asking, I understand that very few lawyers deal with WSIB claims. I tried reaching one through the legal referral service, but never got a response. How do I find a good lawyer who will deal with WSIB? Uh, if you find them, let me know so that I can certainly send my clients that are potential clients that are looking for that. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of lawyers that do that law. And it's for one real reason. And uh, it's in WSIB, if you're making a claim, they're going to pay your benefits to you in a monthly basis. They're going to pay the treatment providers on a regular basis. And they're never going to give you a lump sum amount or a large damage award. And because lawyers who do this work generally do it on contingency fee basis and not on hourly rates, lump outs from WSIB don't exist. Therefore, those types of arrangements and agreements don't work for them. That's why it's difficult. The one person, uh, Rob McGill, um, that's who is a lawyer. He was out of London. Very, very good. I, I hope he's still doing it. Um, but I mean, 
I can only come up with one name. Wow. Okay. Um, what if there is no means for a lawsuit? So for example, you haven't been in a car accident. Is representation still available? You're not in a car crash, but you've Yeah, been I think they're saying that they don't fall into any of those categories that you described. Yeah, yeah, no, which is, which is, you know, no, I mean, if. Yeah. There isn't but, a lot for you. I but mean, Patrick, you're going into more the, than... the, the, the system that, that you're looking for social security nets, you, you're you going to have to turn towards perhaps Obaya and, and some other mm -hmm. networks that are there to help individuals. But the lawyers, if there's not a lawsuit and there's not something that they think is available to them to be paid, they're not going to get involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dr. Tatter, did you want to add something there? But I was just, maybe it's just the way the question was worded, but I think we've described so many situations where a lawyer will would be helpful. Um, you know, there are a lot of even you know, sports and recreational um, items or work-related work items where WSIB isn't involved. So I think there are lots of situations where lawyers can be helpful. It's, it's the not, best way is to ask. Not, Just ask. Pardon? A lawyer will tell you if they can help you or not. I mean, I'm looking back at the question. I, I suppose I I didn't see that part. It, it, it just said, um, for example, an at-fault accident, car crash, meaning they're at fault. Should they talk to a lawyer? Well, yeah, you should, because that lawyer is going to let you know what other benefits, because we do have a, a no-fault benefit system for auto crashes, that there are benefits available to you, even if you're at fault. Yeah, and there's a lot of benefits that can be available. So you should talk to a lawyer. Even if you feel like in that question, it's an at you're at fault for the car crash. Well, you still have you still have other access to things. Yes. Okay. Uh, we've got someone else saying that they've got a lawyer, but she's not responding to my questions or emails. She says she's always busy. Any advice on how to deal with this situation and what to say to the lawyer? The lawyer should respond to you, or their staff should be responding, and you should have the available time. Lawyers can be busy. So they can have a trial. They could be on trial. They could be on discoveries, mediations. And sometimes they can't get back to you right away. Okay. But somebody should be getting back to you in order to set up a time that you can speak to that lawyer and have a conversation about whatever question you have. So the best way is I, I would I'd contact their office. And instead of them picking up the phone right away, is there a time that you can set up that I can speak to my lawyer? And that lawyer should be speaking to you. <laughs> Absolutely. They're, okay. they're required to. Great. And what if the plaintiff loses at trial and costs are awarded against them? Who pays the cost if there is a contingency retainer? So your lawyer will not get anything paid to them if you lose the case, meaning they're not going to charge you a fee because it's a contingency. And most of the agreements as well, you don't have to pay back the disbursements. But that doesn't mean that the other side who you sued and has now won the case and said, oh, you lost, you should have never sued me. And now I've got 150,000 worth of legal costs. You're not protected from that unless you've bought what's called cost mm -hmm. insurance. And that's a product that's available to the individual at the beginning of a case where it, 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 it provides them protection against a cost award against them. It's called cost insurance. You should talk to your lawyer about that. Um, we have it available, but many lawyers have that available. And it's one way to protect yourself from the other side's cost. But yeah, you are responsible for it. Okay. Um, okay, the questions just keep coming. So I think we're gonna have to, to wrap up here. Um, Next one is, how is someone who is suffering from concussion and has cognitive issues supposed to make all these decisions well? Who can they turn to for help for even finding a lawyer, for example? Well, I think there are places that would help. For example, I mentioned Obaya, 
as having the website available where they list lawyers that um, can take cases. So I think there are people, I think that oh, occupational therapists, physiotherapists would also be able to have had some experience with other patients who have had lawyers for concussion. Ask your family doctor. That's a fair question to ask your family doctor as well. I think any healthcare professional would try to help a patient make a decision about a lawyer. Yeah, I think there are a lot of people who could help. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I do think you have to put a little due diligence into it. Unfortunately, you're not in the best condition to do that. So maybe get a family member you trust or somebody who's been in the field, that, if, like whether they're in the insurance industry field, uh, they could be in the medical field that deal with cases like this. They can be the legal. Um, get somebody to help you navigate it a bit. Um, and it could be a family member. But, you know, there's the ABI network that has a whole database of lawyers who deal with the acquired brain injury uh, cases. And so that's there and available to you. But um, due diligence, ask the right questions. And and yeah, if, if you're having a hard time navigating yourself, I find a lot of people get help from other members in their family that know a bit about it, meaning they're not just winging it. Don't go because you see someone on the back of a bus or they've got the biggest billboard because you might be disappointed. Yeah. And what if after six years, I think my lawyer is not doing a good job and I want to change lawyers? Do I still have to pay for his services when the case settles? You can you you, you can change lawyers at any time but you will be responsible to pay a certain amount of money to that lawyer when your case is settled. But generally the new lawyers that take over the case will tell you that they will likely have that lawyer's fees paid from their fees so that you're not charged anything more. But you do, there is going to be an amount that has to be paid to them, but that will only take place at the end of the case. Okay. Are you okay to do two more questions and then I will stop? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Okay. Uh, Rachel asks, my daughter fell back in her chair in kindergarten while at school and sustained a TBI, traumatic brain injury, but the teacher did not send her to the nurse, didn't give her ice and did not contact me. She had persistent concussion uh, symptoms and ongoing issues for many years and still does. Do you know what legal action could be taken? A lawyer looking at that case, uh, especially with a child, um, those are those are very unique. Uh, firstly, the lawyer is going to take a look at to see if is there potential. Well, firstly, they're going to find out whether or not this young lady with her persistent concussion syndrome and ongoing issues, if it's ongoing for many years, and her medical practitioners think that it's related from this incident that happened. Well, then that could be very significant. The lawyer is going to look to see, though, whether or not there's negligence in relation to the school board or the teacher. That may have everything to do with the monitoring as to why the young child fell back in her chair and whether or not there was proper monitoring. If they think that there's exposure there and that there is some responsibility then they're going to have, and these are really difficult, to find out what type of damages would flow to this young lady. And that really does require medical professionals that not only deal with concussion and head injuries, but also understand pediatric head injuries and concussions and are going to give opinions when they feel they can. Because many times they say, we can't even give you an opinion until certain milestones are met. And so I would tell you though, that you have under the law, the limitation period doesn't start until her 18th birthday. So if it's a two year limitation, which likely this is, you wouldn't have to commence a lawsuit until two years from the 18th birthday. So it gives you an understanding that you have some time to determine whether or not this is worth proceeding and a lawyer will tell you what they think in that regard. 
Great, thank you. And just on the imaging front, um, what about a functional MRI to identify changes in the brain after a concussion? Well, that's a great question. And certainly uh, our center has been looking at that possibility for a number of years. Um, maybe we're getting closer, especially some of the network uh, type information that we're getting about how messages are transferred to different parts of the brain um, from from the injured area, uh, for example, to different parts of the brain, but we're not quite there yet. It's very complicated, but my colleague Carmela Tartaglia is quite an expert on that. Uh, and hopefully sometime in the near future, We'll have we'll have some positive answers that it may be a good test for concussion, but today at right today it's not. Great, thank you. Okay, and last question. This is sort of similar to a prior one, but how is someone who's experiencing concussions, concussion symptoms, expected to go through the legal system, like answer questions at examinations for discovery, if they have trouble putting words together to speak? Great question. Um, it, it's not easy, and, and nor are examinations for discovery. Uh, firstly, make sure you're prepared in advance so that you understand exactly what's going to take place. Make sure your lawyer understands your difficulties that you're having, whether it's following questions or responding, and make sure that uh, they understand that these are going to be some issues that you have in getting through that process. So that um, ask your lawyer, I, I do want to have breaks. If I ask for a break, can you make sure I get one um, and, and do whatever you can to accommodate yourself, but you will have to go through that process. It just might mean it takes longer with more breaks um, in order to get you through there. I, I right. would just add to that, that um, if, if that is a major aspect of the concussion symptoms that you should have a thorough neuropsychological testing and perhaps also be seen by a speech and language pathologist. Uh, it's very helpful to have the appropriate uh, specialists involved in that type of disability. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you so much to both of you uh, for excellent talks and for answering um, all of those questions. And thanks for all of you that held on for an extra long webinar tonight. So as always, we'll be sending you uh, a very short feedback questionnaire. So if you have a couple minutes, give us your feedback. Uh, and we will ha be having one more webinar before uh, the end of the year, and that will be on December the 5th. And I'm going to be um, interviewing a patient panel for that one. So it'll be a little bit uh, different format. So thank you again. And thank you, Christian, as well for holding on. Yeah. And uh, have a great night, everyone. Good night.